again on this cold, blustery evening. My name is Namisha Kelly, and I am an assistant professor in the public health program. And um, I am just so thrilled and excited to see all of you here. I want to thank you for choosing to attend the special presentation. Um, I also want to take this uh, opportunity to announce that students who are enrolled in social inequities in health and also in criminal justice and public health, make sure you sign in so that you can get credit for attending this lecture. So if you haven't done so, please do so now or by the end of the lecture. So as um, Professor Cummings mentioned, this is a special presentation that is part of the new course in criminal justice and public health. And I'm happy to say that um, TUC's MPH program is the first graduate program that is accredited by the Council on Education for Public Health to offer a curriculum emphasis in health equity and criminal justice. And we are very proud to have Dr. Miller's participation in this important focus on the intersection of the criminal justice system and public health. His lecture in this new course will provide students with an overview of the intersection um, and also students will gain an understanding of how the U.S. mass incarceration um, issue is a public health issue, number one, and also a social determinant of health. First, I also want to extend a, a big special thanks to our director, our administrative coordinator, Charlene Williams, and our program analyst, Ms. Sharon Chesney, including our TUC public relations team for all of their assistance and support in promoting this event. I also want to introduce to you the course coordinator, uh, the course instructor for criminal justice and public health, Ms. Mary Silla. Please stand, Ms. Silla. As a course coordinator for this new course, I've been working with Mary over the past few months and it's been really exciting. Um, Ms. Silla has over 20 years experience in um, the area of incarceration and, and health. She's been focusing in, at the intersection for for some time now. She's advocated for prisoners' rights, including access to HIV treatment and prevention. Um, at the AIDS Project Los Angeles and also working for ACLU of Southern California. She's worked with Center Force of Oakland, California, um, began there in 2005, and she returned in 2017 to serve as their fund development director, and she's focusing there on funding and capacity building. So we'd like to um, welcome um, Dr. Miller to the stage. And I just wanted to read a few words about his, um, give you a, a bit of information and background about Dr. Miller. He's an assistant professor in the University of Chicago of the School of Social Service Administration. His research examines life at the intersections of race, poverty, crime control, and social welfare policy. He's completing a book titled Halfway Home, um, Race Punishment and the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration. And it's based on 15 years of research and practice with currently and formerly incarcerated men, women, their families, partners, and friends. Dr. Miller has conducted field work in Chicago, Detroit, and New York City, examining how law, policy, and emergent practices of state and third party supervision change the contours of citizenship, activism, community, and family life of poor black Americans and the urban poor more broadly. To capture the effects of crime control and social life in global cities with different public policies, Miller conducts ongoing field work in Glasgow, London, and Belgrade. He's launching a comparative study of punishment and social welfare policy in the poor cities that were most involved in the transatlantic Atlantic slave trade. This project title, On the Tracks of Empire, takes place in the archives courtrooms, prisons, halfway houses, and homes of prisoners and former prisoners in cities along the trade route from Dakar to New Orleans and from Elmina to Baltimore. A native son of Chicago's South Side, Dr. Miller received his PhD from Loyola University, Chicago, and um, an AM from University of Chicago, and a BA from Chicago State University. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Ruben Miller. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much for coming out. This is this has been it's been a fun trip. It's always nice to be here. I'm I'm, I'm super happy um, to join you, uh, and thank you for the for the invitation back. Uh, so so to get the thank yous 
um, out the way. I'd like to thank Professor Kelly and Professor Cummings um, for, for the invitation and for working out the details of this trip. Um, thank you also to the provost and the faculty here at Toro University, the administration and staff, including Charlie Williams, and Disney, and these other folks who have had the chance to, 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 to spend some time with, uh, some of whom, um, uh, Professor Wilson, for example, are, are now old friends. Um, and it's good to see you all again. Uh, thank you also to the staff and students and community members here and to members of the activist uh, legal health and social services community and to many new friends uh, who do the work that must be done. And, and, and those, are, those, who, those working in this area know uh, that this is the kind of work um, that perhaps imagines a different world. I, 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 I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to also say, man, a, a spoken word performance before a talk that's kind of dope uh, that has not happened for me before. I'm grateful the poem was dope. Thank you very much. Um, and I'd also like to say that in some ways this is a work in progress. I'm, I'm, I'm finishing my book, Halfway Home, uh, which will be out uh, next February. And so, and so I'm finishing, uh, I'm writing furiously. I intend to be finished within the next uh, two months or so. I've been working on it what seems like forever. Um, and anyway, so, so, so again, I'd like, to, I'd, like to, I'd like to just say that those working um, in this area know that this is the kind of work um, perhaps um, that might imagine a new world. And I'd like for us to think about a new world together. But in order to do that, I think we have to sketch the contours of the old one. And, and, and I think we can take um, here uh, uh, a lesson and follow the abolitionists of our age um, who would imagine a new world, one that perhaps does not include police and jails and detention centers and prisons and electronic monitoring and criminal databases with its host of registries and unequal forms of justice to begin with. Or at least we might imagine a world without the excesses of our current crime control apparatus. Uh, we, would, we, would, we would know, or at least we would take as our starting point the fact that our systems of crime control put far too many people away, and it has done so for far too long. In fact, we put more people away, as you know, than, than any other country uh, in the history of the so-called developed world. And this is an, a fairly old problem to just dive. Let's just dive right in. Let, let, let's just start. In fact, it was 1970 when James Baldwin published his now famous open letter to his sister, Angela Davis, in the New York Review of Books. The title was an open letter to my sister, Angela Davis, on the occasion of her arrest. He writes, one might have hoped that by this hour, the very sight of chains on black flesh would be so intolerable a sight for the American people that they would themselves spontaneously rise up and strike off the manacles. But no, now more than ever, they appear to glory in their chains. Now more than ever, they glory in their chains and corpses. And so Newsweek, he writes, civilized defender of the indefensible, attempts to drown you in a sea of crocodile tears and puts you, Sister Davis, on the cover in chains. Echoing the corpus of his previous work, Baldwin called attention to the contradictions of the American state, revealing the nation's failure to reckon with its history of racial violence and the acts of racial abuse embedded within her institutions. Poor black Americans would be the bellwether for things to come. An increasing but unappreciated number of poor whites would follow. They were criminalized and over-policed, yet at the same time underprotected. They lived in slums and in poor rural towns, subjected to depressed wages and police abuse, yet unable to find common ground with the poor blacks despite their shared circumstances. Poor whites would share the fate of Angela Davis and George Jackson and many political prisoners before them, like the Attica brothers, who were soon to be terrorized in the nation's growing prison state. They had a linked fate, proven, as Baldwin says, by the, quote, corpses from Vietnam. But this state of affairs remained hidden in plain sight, obscured by the ignorance that politicians and a growing culture industry cultivated among poor whites, whose chief success was convincing the American public that black people, that black Americans were the cause of their own problems and that white America was innocent of its sins. This is Baldwin. 
writing in 1970, two years before we began the experiment in mass incarceration. Having identified the disaffected and increasingly militant black youth as the source of the urban condition, he says that white America and that America more broadly, the American empire, came to quote, measure their safety in chains and corpses. 50 years later, his words are all the more prescient. Since the publication of Baldwin's open letter, the United States began a dramatic experiment in human caging. On any given day, as many of us know, over two million people are held in an American jail or prison, a sevenfold increase since its 1970 publication. Two thirds of all US inmates are poor and nearly 40% are black, despite black Americans representing just 12% of the US population. And the share of Latinos occupying a cage is rising steadily. And black women, whose incarceration rate has increased 14 fold since 1970, are the fastest growing prison demographic. Similar trends are found among the elderly who all too frequently die behind bars, spending their fi final years disproportionately suffering from illnesses associated with aging, like dementia and Alzheimer's disease. This is because of sentencing laws. Folks go away for 20, 30, 40 years, and then later, later exonerated. And we've learned that gender and sexuality matter in important ways too. Lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth, and especially GLBTQ youth of color, are disproportionately and overwhelmingly represented in the juvenile justice system. While recent research on prison conditions and activist campaigns highlight the acute forms of sexual violence incarcerated trans women endure. And with all things, this is especially the case for trans women of color. That is, poor black and brown trans women in the United States. Even the nation's children experience the pains of imprisonment. Nearly three million children have an incarcerated parent, including one in nine black children, nearly all of whom are poor. And as you all know, changes in school discipline over the last two decades suggest that these trends will just continue, given the infamous school to prison pipeline. But I'd like to say that there are many more pipelines, of course. There is the Child Protective Services to Prison Pipeline, where in states like Michigan, nearly 40% of all foster kids will wind up in a jail cell. There's the Mental Health Abuse to Incarceration Pipeline, and actually a premature death to incarceration pipeline, where a recent report shows that roughly half of un all unarmed black American men and women killed in recent years by the police were experiencing an identifiable mental health crisis. The fairly recent state of affairs has turned the public's attention toward the fundamental contradiction. There are more prisoners in the land of the free than there are in any other nation in the history of the modern world. Its scale alone warrants scholarly attention. But it's fair to say that we have not yet come to grips with the real problem. Baldwin says, if you want to know how justice is administered, if you want to know the state of a democracy. Don't ask the police. Don't go to the courts. Don't ask the upper class. He says, ask any Mexican, any Puerto Rican, any black man, any poor person. Ask the wretched how they fare in the halls of justice. And then you will know not whether or not a country has any love for justice, but whether or not they have any semblance of it. Mass incarceration is not just a problem for poor black people. Mass incarceration is a problem of citizenship. We have produced an alternate form of citizenship, one that is distinct and distinctly reserved for the kinds of people we fear. But this is the punchline, right? This is, this is the end of the talk. I'm not at the end yet. I'm just starting. I'm just getting warmed up. I still have things to share, so let, 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 me, let me, what I'd like to do, I still, like, I still have things to share. What I'd like to do is talk to you about the kinds of people that we fear and the kinds of people that we loathe. In order to do that, I have to start with an example. A video surfaces from March 24th, 2017. A blurred image of an officer talking to a man on the street in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Now, it's hard to make out what they're saying. Something about kids in a basketball game and a gun, light skin, curly hair. The media reports their conversation this way. A boy in black pulls a black re a revolver from his book bag and, quote, hundreds of boys got into a fight at the Salvation Army Croc Center. 
By the time the police arrived, the boys had dispersed. 20 or so were left playing basketball. After all the reports come in, here's what we know. A black boy wearing black had a gun. The gun was a revolver. There was a basketball game. There was a fight. Another scene. This time the view was from the officer's chest cam. He pulls his car in park and opens the driver's side door. We see down the barrel of his already uh, drawn gun that there are five black boys in the distance. Guys, get on the ground. Keep your hands up, he says. The orders come quickly, but his voice is calm. Two of the boys get down. Three are moving slowly. The footage reveals the boys' personalities. One is obedient, shaken, but still his face down during most of the ordeal. Another fidgets, unsure of whether to lay on his belly or walk toward the officer. What do we do, bro? Asks another prone boy, his head and arms raised awkwardly. Another is afraid. He starts to cry. I don't want to die, he says. Was this the youngest child? Reports say the boys are between 12 and 14 years old. The last boy, the one in black, is noticeably angry. Can you please put your gun away? He starts to stand as he repeats his request. Can you please, A, shouts the officer, don't come over here. The officer is calm again. Keep your hands where I can see them, he says. Get on the ground. The chance of the murmuring 12-year-old boy build into a full-out wail. I don't want to die, he cries loudly to no one in particular. OK, the officer says. Just calm down. It'll be all right. His voice now soothing, as if he knows he's talking to children, but his gun is still drawn. The crying 12-year-old tries reason, whimpering. I have a basketball game tomorrow. The boy in black tells the wailing boy to stop. I don't want to die, bro. Just follow our direction, says the officer, before calling in some code. He says they're compliant. A mother, seeing the action from her stoop, moves toward the fray. Ma'am, can you get back in the house for me, he asked. Impossible. A gun is drawn on her child. She must go to him. Ma'am, ma'am, shouts the officer. Another cut scene, another officer, this time speaking to the mother from the stoop. He just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. Exasperated, she puts her hands on her head. He sh exasperated, she puts her hands on her head. Whoops. <laughs> uh, uh, where am I? Uh, no glasses today. Uh, the officer continues, no one was hurt, everything's okay. He says this twice. I'm sorry, I don't mean no disrespect, but you have to understand, the mother says. Understand, I understand, the officer cuts in. You have to understand our position as well, the officer says as if this is an argument, as if there are two sides, as if this is just a story. There is a gun and there are many of them and they are all pointed at her child. Her voice breaks. When a mother comes to you, she says. The officer interrupts her again. Yeah, but the way you were acting, the mother's had enough. I can't help it, that's my baby. We don't deal with police. We never even have no charges. We don't do this. All the stuff that's going on in this world, I worry about my kids every day. That's why I don't let them go nowhere. A cut scene. One of the boys joins the conversation. The one in black who got up a few times, who seems like he's the oldest. He might be 14. So he's not in trouble at all, the officer says. The mother turns to her son. You know I'm scared, don't ever do this. That's why I never let y'all go nowhere. In the final scene, the one that's shown, the video returns to an officer talking to two parents, these two on the screen. We're just doing our job. A lot of people out here have guns, the officer says. We're not saying your kids had guns or anything like that, but we're just doing our jobs. A father's talking now. You say they didn't have guns, but you pulled your guns? The officer responds. You understand where we're coming from? Matching description? We're not just gonna walk up to someone and say, hey, do you have a gun on you? We're just, we're just taking every precaution. No one got hurt in this. Everyone's been cooperative with us, okay? It's not like we're out here, like the father calmly interrupts. Y'all gotta understand our side too. Our kids go to the center to play basketball. That's it, plain and simple. Wrong place at the wrong time. Obviously for these kids, says the officer. Right place at the wrong time, says the father. They were at the right place. End of footage. There was, of course, no weapon. The response from the parents to stay with their children and the confusion, fear, and frustration of the boys should make sense to most observers. Why wouldn't a 12-year-old fear for his life? Why wouldn't a 14-year-old be angry? Why would a mother stand by and watch while police point guns at her child? 
Officer said that no one was hurt. I suppose the family should be thankful. Much worse has happened under hauntingly similar circumstances. And I'm sure the parents of the five black boys were surprised when the police chief apologized. But the police union issued their own statement within the hour. Here's what they said. They said the officers followed protocol and the protocol would not change. But my question, how, but, but why is this the protocol? And how did we get here? In some ways, this is an old story, one that's been told before. Now, it would be tempting to start with the war on drugs or the advent of modern policing, but our understandings of black crime and black guilt and the collective sin that renders black people criminal predates the concept of race itself. The idea of a black people uniform and constituted as black is a child itself of racial slavery. Before then, neither European aristocrats calling for unfree labor, the raiders they sent to plunder the African continent, or the network of merchants, middlemen, or warrior aristocracies that supplied slaves to the coast thought of the people that we call black today as a people at all. They were outsiders, foreigners, like the Eastern Europeans and the classes of barbarians traded by warring empires. Sadia Hartman, the eminent scholar of transatlantic slavery, put it best. She said, Africans did not sell their brothers and sisters into slavery, contrary to popular belief. They sold strangers, those outside the web of kin and clan relationships, foreigners and barbarians, lawbreakers expelled from society. She says, in order to betray your race, you had to first imagine yourself as one. Now, this isn't to say that a human hierarchy did not exist and slaves were certainly at the bottom. But the exclusive trade in Africans wasn't established until the 15th century. Prior to then, the slave trade was mostly dominated by folks, uh, Eastern Europeans, people we call Slavs, so much so that Slav becomes the root word for slave. Now, this is not the same kind of slavery. This is not chattel slavery for a lifetime. It's a very different kind of slavery. Um, and there's much history. There's, there's, there's much to this history. There are rebellions by slaves and Native Americans by the time we get to the, to the, to the New World um, who die by the thousands resisting captivity and death from disease. And Blacks, though they rebelled, were viewed as best suited for and in need of the salvation of racial slavery. So I should, I should say something about this. I'm going to back up. I was going to not do all the, the, this history because it's not a ton of time, but, 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 I, but I, I need to do a little bit. So 14... 03 or so, uh, 1415, certainly by 1415, uh, and this, this is recounted in, in these beautiful books that, that are up here, certainly um, Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram X. Kennedy, uh, K Kendi, um, and, and in some ways, Illusion Mother and Racecraft, you know, speak to the, to the fallout from, from this moment. But, but the, by the time the Portuguese, King Alphonse of Portugal takes over a Moroccan slave trading post, and at that point, the access to, to, to Sub-Saharan Africa for the Europeans uh, sort of opens. And at the same time, Slavs are building fortresses against slave ra raiders. And so two things are happening. On the one hand, uh, 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 it's harder to get Slavs to be slaves. And on the other hand, it's easier to get Africans to be slaves because, because it's open, right? The, 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 trade, the trade is open. Um, and so, and so, and so, and so, uh, what happens is, is, is there's a shift in the slave economy around the 15th, around the 15th century where, where, where slavery goes from being a white thing to, to, to being the exclusive trade in people that we will eventually call black. Whiteness also is not a thing yet, I should say. Um, so how is whiteness made? Well, whiteness is made through racial slavery, just as blackness is made through racial slavery. There's, there's a series of, of rebellions that happen all throughout every moment in, 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 in the slave trade. There are rebellions in the villages, rebellions on the boats, there are rebellions uh, 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 on the plantations. There's rebellions that happen constantly. And at this time, there was an emphasis on indentured servants. So blacks had effectively replaced Native Americans as the chief laborers in the country because black folks weren't dying in the field from European disease. Uh, Europe, uh, Native Americans were. Uh, and, so, and so they replaced them. But at the same time, they also had indentured servants that they brought that, that, that were over here that mostly came over as convicts uh, through, through, through uh, you know, a series of moves running from the hangman's noose in London, et cetera, et cetera. Well, indentured, an indentured servant's life wasn't much better than a slave at the time. Uh, they could be whipped and raped and beat and sold and traded during the seven years of their indenture. And they would often band 
and with their with slaves. And this was a colonist nightmare. They had kids together and they strategized together and they plotted insurrections together, the most famous of which is Bacon's Rebellion, uh, which was a rebellion that, you know, led by a white landowner, uh, but was that used the muscle of white indentured of people that we would later call white indentured servants and people we would later call black um, African slaves, and that muscle together uh, they, they, they burned Jamestown to the ground. The, the, the insurrection, the rebellion was put down very quickly by the help of a thousand troop uh, English army and 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 uh, Bacon caught dysentery, <laughs> but this isn't the point. Uh, the, the, at the, once they put down the rebellion, they established a series of codes, slave codes, that 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 made uh, miscegenation or, or having children together or marriage together illegal. That made teaching slaves to read illegal. That allowed whites to have access to native lands. Uh, uh, th th that made the collaboration between blacks and whites illegal, and that created that and created social distance. And this work to separate black slaves and freedmen from the poor servants who were newly made white took place across law and in everyday life. We saw this legislatively through the slave codes of the 17th and 18th century that criminalized the vestiges of black freedom like assembling together or reading or traveling or owning weapons. But we also saw this in everyday life. We saw this in, 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 in figurines, in, 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 in media uh, displays. We saw this in the ways that 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 certain kinds of work were presented for certain kinds of people. This is, this is from Robin Bernstein's beautiful book uh, on racial innocence. Thank you so much. Um, and, and, and there are two pictures here. One, one is, is a picture of, of, of a black girl um, drawn to show her picking cotton. And, and, and what it shows is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a soft, um, kind of natural, kind of happy, kind of docile, kind of glorious labor for this kind of child. And the other from the 19th century is a picture of a white child who's picking cotton and we see that it's sullen and it's sad and she's alone. And so what we see in this moment is a narrative of racial difference that happens through law and it happens in everyday life. It happens through culture, and we see the separation of black people from white folks, and we see some folks being presented as, as the kinds of people that should do certain kinds of work. And we see the, pre the, the presentation of, 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 of some people as, 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 as being harmed by engaging in certain kinds of work. These sorts of images effectively uh, establish the separation between black and white people along with the rebellions and the laws and all these things, but it also stripped black folks of their innocence. Trick is depicting smiling black, ch black children enjoying the backbreaking labor of slavery, and the books published even by abolitionists show black slaves as happy and docile. The results were absolute. All black people of all people of African descent were black. All slaves were black people. All black people were ordained by their creator to do the work of slavery. Racial slavery was in their best interest. The new nation with its promise of freedom and equality for all men thrived in its contradictions, becoming an economic and military power fueled by black slave labor. Now, while the fear of black insurrection was always there because black folks rebelled at every turn, and white slave patrols, constables, and eventually the police stood at the ready to beat black, back black rebellion, the tone and tenor of how black people were depicted changed after emancipation. In the words of historian David Levering Lewis, the African American becomes demonized after the Civil War. A threat, a lascivious beast roaming the countryside of the South, people loosed by the end of slavery and, and now upon us like locusts. The idea of black criminality began to preoccupy American minds. Police in the South rounded up black people by the thousands for failing to work, for attempting to leave the South, for petty crimes like being idle. And the convict leasing system ballooned and chain gangs stretched throughout the region as newly freed slaves and their children were shipped off to rebuild the South. This was, in my estimation, an early form of mass incarceration. The inmate population in Southern states more than tripled between 1865 and 1890. And there was over-incarceration in the North as black workers fled the terror of the South just to be arrested in cities like Chicago, Philadelphia, St. Louis, New York, Oakland, LA, and on and on. 
Now, the history from this point has been told a dozen times by a dozen brilliant historians, from the tabulating of black crime in ways that erased immigrant white criminality to the many wars on the poor, the war on crime, the war on drugs, and to some extent, even the war on poverty. Black men and women would be over-incarcerated and increasingly treated like criminals. So by the time the Grand Rapids police held those five unarmed black boys at gunpoint, the collective guilt and criminality of black people especially the poor, had long been established. This is why the psychologist Philip Atiba Goff found that black boys were viewed as less innocent than whites and thought to be much older, 4.5 years on average in recent studies. And while the psychologists Rebecca Hetty and Jennifer Eberhardt found in their studies that as white Americans become more aware of black overrepresentation in U.S. jails and prisons, they tend to favor more punitive criminal justice policies and become more worried about crime. This happened by showing pictures of mugshots, having, having white college students watch videos where mugshots were run by, and they'd see mugshots that depicted more or less black people. One mugshot would show something like 40% of, or 25% of the mugshots would be black. Another mugshot would show something like 40% of the, the mugshots would be black. The students would be asked how they felt about a particular criminal justice policy, and they'd be less in favor to strike down more punitive policies and more in favor of more, and they'd also be asked how they felt about crime, and they would report being more uh, concerned about crime, these two groups that are showing these different things, the group that saw more black people. The same thing happens when they just read statistics about crime. And this was residents of New York City. When asked whether or not they favored stop and frisk, when residents of New York City, white residents, read statistics about uh, uh, the representation of black people in the criminal justice system, when the statistic was lower, they were more likely to favor less punitive policies, like stop and frisk, they say get rid of it. When the, when the, when, when the, when the representation was higher, they were more likely uh, to, 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 they were less likely to support getting rid of stop and frisk, for example. And so, and so it's in this cauldron, it's in this cauldron uh, that we see where these black boys encounter the police. The work of separation is complete. Black boys were not only guilty, but black children were no longer viewed as innocent. They were super predators, marauding and wayward participants in wildings and the so-called knockout game. Or they're viewed in the latest progressive explanations as, quote, disconnected youth, being disconnected from school and the labor market. No wonder black people are twice as likely to be arrested than whites and five times more likely to be incarcerated. No wonder they do more time. No wonder unarmed black boys are 21 times more likely to be killed by the police. No wonder why their mothers worry every time they lose a, leave, leave the house. Over a third of these boys will be arrested by the time they turn 18, and nearly half by the time they turn 23. Over half can look forward to occupying a cage if they drop out of high school, along with a third of those who don't. Everyone I knew understood these statistics, and we knew them from our flesh. This is because the prison was bulging at its seams, and we had a sense that our neighborhoods were feeding it. Mass incarceration isn't just a problem of criminal justice. It doesn't just show up in the criminal justice system. Mass incarceration is a public health crisis. We know that HIV prevalence in prisons is five times higher than it is in the general population. The hepatitis C is nine times higher. We know that nearly a third of all folks who, who, who had a, who, uh, individuals who had a communicable disease, communicable disease passed through the prison through studies that have happened since as early as the 90s. And we know that the population is rapidly aging and that, and that imprisonment has negative health and mental health outcomes. In fact, a study by Evelyn Patterson finds, for example, looking, using New York State, um, and using like life table modeling in New York State, she estimates that for every year an inmate spent in prison, they lost two years off their lifetime. And let's not forget about the questions of legitimacy. Through stop and frisk, we see that black and Latino Americans are stopped despite evidence. They're, they're, they're stopped more often than whites, whether or not they actually had guns or contraband, the reason for the stop, whether or not they match the description of a person who committed a crime in the area, whether or not a crime was ever committed in the area. And we also know that it was found to be unconstitutional. And let's not forget about exonerations. 
Since 1989, over 2,000 people have been found innocent after spending on average nine years in a prison. Two thirds of this group are black or Latino. My position is that this is a matter of citizenship. Over 40 million, uh, there are over 40 million police stops each year. 40 million. So much so that Joe Sass and Vesla Weaver, two political scientists, uh, make the bold statement in an article, a review article on, 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 on policing and citizenship, that, that the police are indeed our government. That police, the, the, the police is the modal encounter for certainly for poor black Americans, for poor Latino Americans, that the modal encounter with the government is the police, and that they understand their position in the democratic project through this encounter. I believe that we see something uh, that has emerged in the last, um, since the rise of mass incarceration, but certainly in the last 10 or 20 years. I don't think that what we're looking at here is second class citizenship. I think what we're looking at here is something else. I think we're seeing the emergence of a new form of citizenship that, 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 is, that is certainly directed at people with criminal records. It's something that I write about as carceral citizenship. It's because there are unique restrictions, unique rights, and unique responsibilities that come with uh, the mark of a criminal record. We know that there are unique restrictions, over 48,000 laws. We know that the unique rights, uh, talk about rights with kind of tongue in cheek, but, but risk laws give you access to services, you know, this sort of thing. We can have a conversation about that. But it's certainly unique responsibilities, uh, the responsibility to, to, to not cross state lines, to go to AA, to check in, these sorts of things that come with this. But, but most importantly, the thing I'd like to focus on now is that what folks who are in this citizenship track have is a unique experience of American democracy. They experience American democracy in a very different way. Now when asked, who are these people? And to understand the scale of this problem, we have to first put the prison itself in its place. So we started off this talk by talking about how many people were in a cage in a given day. 2.2 million people, 2.3 million people I think this year, occupy a cage on any given day in the United States. But we know that if we compare this to the number of people who are on probation or parole, that the folks on probation and parole are twice that size. 4.7 to 4.8 million people are currently on probation or parole, tethered through an electronic uh, monitor strapped to their ankle, uh, or they just have to check in with a PO. But if we change the unit of analysis, from a point in time count to the number of people who are processed through a system on any given, in any given year, we know that 12 million people get processed through county jails. Most of these folks are in pretrial detention. Most of these folks are incarcerated without being convicted of anything. And we know uh, since about 2010 that the 19.6 million Americans that have a felony conviction 19.6 million Americans, this, this is 10 times the size of the prison. And we also know that the Bureau of Justice Statistics have told us that since 2014, when they did the count, that there were 79 million Americans that had a criminal record in the United States. 79 million Americans, a third of US adults, have a criminal record. What does this tell us? This tells us that formerly incarcerated people aren't just held in jails and prisons. They're managed across multiple sites by multiple actors. And that, and, that, and that community is where the action is. And the prison, despite its place in the public's imagination, is just one small slice of a vast carceral network. I'll show this in a second, but I'd like to make a claim here. If we think that mass incarceration stops at the threshold of the black family, we'd be absolutely wrong. While it's true that there are studies that show that something like 49% of black American boys will be arrested by the time they turn 23, that's absolutely true. That was the study that happened in 2016. That's what the study says. I'm not saying the studies, you know, right or wrong. I'm saying that we have studies that show this. 49% of black boys will be arrested by the time they turn 23 for a non-traffic violation. But 39% of white boys will be arrested by the time they turn 23 for a non-traffic violation. Forty percent of white boys in this country can't come from bad families. 
neither can 49% of black boys. We know that 44% of black women have a currently incarcerated loved one, 44%, nearly one in two, but one in eight white women has a currently incarcerated loved one. One in eight white women can't come from bad families. It's too many. Neither can one in two black women. There was a recent report called one in two that shows over one in two Americans has someone in their nuclear or extended family that has ever been incarcerated. One in two Americans, over, it's like 65% if you count extended family. 65%, nearly two thirds of all Americans have someone connected to them that's ever been incarcerated. Two thirds of the country can't be from bad families. We all can't be bad. We all can't be dysfunctional, can we? All of us? So what do they face? This is an old screenshot of the National Inventory of the Collateral Consequences of a Criminal Conviction. And what they did was they counted the number of laws, policies, and administrative sanctions that target people with criminal records. How many do you think they found? 48,000. 48,000. Over 48,000 laws, policies, and administrative sanctions that target people with criminal records, barring them from full participation in the political economy and culture. In the state of California, there are 1,523 unique laws, administrative sanctions, and regulations that include 954 laws, policies, or sanctions that prevent or limit people's ability to acquire businesses, occupational, and professional licensure. These are whole categories of employment, whole categories of entrepreneurship. Every answer that we give, we have a law against it. There are 87 that limit political and civic participation. We say, just be more civically involved. 63 that limit access to housing, a full 64 that constrain family and domestic rights. What does this mean? Oh. I had a slide, it, it, it's not there, it's all good. What does this mean? <laughs> it means in most states, you cannot hold public office. It means in most states, if you're convicted of a violent offense, which is over half the prison, I think this year something like 53%, the last count, 53 or 54% of folks in prison are quote, violent offenders. Our interventions all target nonviolent offenders, including the First Step Act including and especially the First Step Act. But that's less than half of the population. If you're on a violent offender registry, a sex offender registry, and in some places a gang database, you can't adopt or foster a kid. You can't be in the same home with, some, with, with, with a foster child or with someone who may be adopted. In the city of Chicago until 2015, you couldn't groom a dog. These laws feel arbitrary and mendacious because they are. So I'd like to tell you a story as we approach the end of, of our time together. And I'd like to tell you a story about a guy named Michael um, because I wanna highlight something different. When Michael was 13, his older brother lost a fight with a boy that was twice his size. This is, you know, just how it goes, you know, getting fights. I got in so many fights when I was a kid. Anyway, in anger and frustration, the brother smashed the car window. Now, it gets complicated because the owner of the car was the, the, uh, the boyfriend of the big kid's mother, and the car was a Porsche 911. It was parked outside the, the apartment complex where they lived. Now... The boyfriend of the big kid's mother said that it would cost $1,500 to fix the window. They, like every other person who I've been talking about today, was broke. 
They couldn't afford it. Here comes a knock at the door. The building manager and two police officers come. They tell the grandmother who's raising the children, the brother had been in too many fights. Either he had to go or they did. Now, the grandmother and the brother knew the pattern. They knew the pattern because uh, the, the boy who had to go was the middle child. Michael, the boy I'm telling you about, was the youngest. His older brother had gotten into fights. The older brother had drank and smoked weed and had sex in the staircase, and the police knocked for him one too many times. The building manager gave them the same ultimatum, but he gave it to him three years before. The older brother leaves, or, those, or everybody in the house is evicted. The grandmother must have thought about what eviction meant for their family, especially for the middle brother and Michael, who was the youngest. She will be put out of an apartment, the very place she couldn't really afford anyway, the place that her husband worked two jobs. He was a steel mill worker, and he painted houses when he got off work. He worked in the steel mill, and in those days, this was the late 80s, he worked in the smokestack of the steel mill. So he developed lung cancer and he died. They had a, they had a, they had a, a, a tweed recliner in their living room that the grandmother kept a quilt over. It was his chair. And the boys couldn't play on that chair. They couldn't sit on that chair. But every time she went out the house, they would jump up and down on the chair. You know, of course they would because it, you know, you know, kids. What could it mean for her to be homeless, to be put outdoors, for a police officer and two movers and the building manager to put her things on the sidewalk? This was a woman who pressed her two work outfits and starched her Sunday clothes and starched the Sunday clothes of the children. This is a woman who made her way up through the second wave of the Great Migration. She was from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, she put herself through secretarial school and moved up north where she met her husband to be put outdoors after putting herself through secretarial school in the Deep South and after raising her own children. There was no choice. The boys had to go. And Michael was alone. Michael was alone. So when he was 13 and his friends ridiculed the little girl and that little girl's father came downstairs and choked Michael in broad daylight, he couldn't call his brothers to come help and stomp out that old man. He told me he was by himself. And when he got in a fight with a boy twice his size and that boy beat him good, he couldn't call his brothers because his brothers were now in group homes. Is this the afterlife of incarceration? The threat of being put outdoors? The lingering stain of arrest that threatened the well-being of everybody you know? The fact that the, your good deeds work against you like Michael's grandmother who nearly lost everything she had because she took in her grandchildren? Or is it the loneliness or that you can't be innocent, that you know the world is hostile to you and the people you love, and at the end of the day, you really are alone? Another story, and then I'll actually close. This is the story of Bridget and her children. Bridget is an activist in the Sunshine State. She lives in a, in a, in a, in a, in a small town in Florida and she's an amazing activist, knocking on doors uh, and, 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 and pushing for the passage, the recent passage of Proposition 4, which restored voting rights to 1.4 million people with felony convictions in the state of Florida. But Bridget is formally incarcerated. She has a criminal record. And she had a hard time finding a place to live. And so she would go around the city and she'd give these talks and people would at some point ask her about her and she'd tell her story and what happened and the fact that she had two children and couldn't find a place to stay. Nobody would rent an apartment to her. And she told me that it seemed like every time she told a story, it's like the more they know about me, the more vulnerable I am because she would tell the story and nobody would respond. And then one day, a woman responded a woman who will follow her around to her talks. It's been a three, four, five, six of her talks. And the woman said, I've got an apartment for you. You come, you stay with me. And this was lovely. This was, this was beautiful. Bridget packs up her things. She moves into the apartment. She pays her rent. She's got a good job. She's got good credit. She's worked hard. She, used to, she was a maid for, 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 for years at Motel Sixes and different motel chains. But the apartment had fleas. And she's sleeping on the floor with her kids 
and the apartment has fleas. And she tells the landlady, the one who tracked her down, the one who followed her from talk to talk and told her, yeah, 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 you come and you stay with me. She said, the apartment has fleas. Will you get rid of them? She said, you should be happy that I've given you a place to stay. Bridget tries to move. The landlord bad mouths her. She's ungrateful. She said, people look at all these accolades. She's won many awards, many prestigious fellowships, and she may even makes decent money. But she can't find a place to stay. She had to move out of her town, the town that is her home and the town where she does her activism. She says, people see all these accolades, but at the end of the day, I'm still a formerly incarcerated woman. This is the price of carceral citizenship. Exclusion from the political economy and culture. Laws on top of laws, 48,000. Different sets of expectations for you than for everybody else. You ought to be happy that I helped you out. This is the kind of thing that you can't treat your way out of. 79 million Americans cannot come from bad families. 79 million Americans may not need cognitive behavioral therapy or any other form of behavioral modification. You can't social service your way out of this. You can't treatment program your way out of this. It's a problem of citizenship and not behavior. So how do we get free? Structural problems require structural solutions. Where do we begin? Maybe we can think about these 48,000 laws and policies. How do the most effective programs, when they are intervening, work well in the lives of people they serve? They work well when they act as bridges to resources, where resource-rich institutions are connected to resource poor people. Let me put it the other way. When resource poor people are connected to resource rich institutions, they tend to do well. So places like universities, public hospitals, or private hospitals, the private even better because, because of the kind of opaque um, uh, governance that happen in private institutions where you don't have to report the things that you, like the people you hire, these sorts of things. When people stick their neck out for other people and they act as a bridge to allow them to have access to housing, uh, shelter, food, et cetera, people do well. But mostly we have to promote the intrinsic humanity of people in this situation. And this, I think, requires us to launch a careful campaign that centers experiences over outcomes. The, the folks, the reason why I open with stories and end it with stories is because I don't want you to think that these people are simply statistics. It's not a trend line. The, the, this, this isn't one more recidivism rate. These are people who have families that love people, that feel things, that experience things. And we should start calling them formerly incarcerated people instead of ex-offender or ex-convict of these words. And they tell us that, by the way. We have to move beyond recidivism and employment and central measures of success and think carefully about questions of human thriving. What would I need to thrive if I were in that situation? What do they need to thrive? Oh, by the way, what do they say they need to thrive? I think there are other things that we can do, including voting. Um, but most importantly, I think we have to listen to formerly incarcerated people and realize that the most effective organizations for change have always been led by people who were directly impacted. Think about it. The civil rights movement was not led by white folks or by the international community. The women's rights movement was not led by men. GLBTQ rights have not been led by straight people. Welfare rights movement was not led by the rich. The landless people movement that we see all through South America was not led by people who had homes, right? And the movement for full and unqualified citizenship for formerly incarcerated people must be led, and I mean led, by formerly incarcerated people. So closing thoughts. I think we live in strange and marvelous times. Now remember, if we think that this is a black thing, after all this important, this careful work to try to show us that race is a fiction, and I don't mean in its consequence. I mean in the presumption that there's something innate about any group of people is racist. Anyway. If we let every black prisoner go today, we'd still have the world's largest prison. 
And I've tried to ask different kinds of questions, different theoretical questions, um, you know, questions about citizenship, moving away from questions of behavior, different empirical questions, where should I look, who should I look at, what should we be thinking about measuring and, and, and discovering. But the question before us is really an ethical one. I think that we live in a supervised society, but the question for us is what kind of society do we want to live in? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. That was, I mean, it's really, I'm really thinking of those ethical questions. And we all have to ask ourselves, what type of society do we want to live in? Um, I think this has been a, just to highlight what it's like to live in a carceral um, state or a constant state of supervision is just something that I think we're all now thinking about. And I wanted to open it up now for a Q&A and questions that you may have for Dr. Miller. I'd love to take your questions. Thank you. Please. That Mm. And to an extent, our families start to, we become conditioned to believe that it is part of my blood, part of my generational cult, curse, part of the legacy of my family name. I had an aunt who was a um, prison, uh, what do they call them, a guard and two of my relatives were also in the prison and the McGee family were there, you know, on both sides of this. Mm -hmm. And that's real for me, that's real. You know, and it's generational and I've, I've seen it happen with my, my grandfather and my uncle and my ex-husband and now my son who's 20. Mm -hmm. I'm digging for answers. Mm -hmm. I'm a journalist. I work for Cron for television. I'm an incarcerated journalist. There's only so much I can do. I'm trying to develop my own talk show called the Bay Area Mental Health Hour because it is affecting my psyche. I'm trying to remain sane. But I'm looking for answers. Yeah. And I know what you said is true. It can't just be about us black people. It ain't about just us black people. It can't be. No. No. So, yeah. but it seems to me that we just go with it. We're just going with it. I ran f from that television station <laughs> to come here, you know. I appreciate you coming. There's another side. There's the opposite view. There's always the other story, the other part of the story. Yeah. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to say, um, I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that comment. Um, and, and I'm so sorry for the experience that you've had. And I share your experience. I've had two brothers go to prison. But every Black person I know that grew up poor has one or two or three brothers or a father or a cousin or an uncle or a son that went to jail or prison. And quiet as it's kept, most poor white people that I know had a brother or uncle or cousin or father or son that went to prison. And so I think this question about what's unique about black people and ideas of generational curses and things like that um, may feel right because I look in my own family and I look at my own friends' families and I see a pattern. But if we step back, we see that we're not alone. 
that it's not just us, that 79 million Americans have been arrested and incarcerated in this country and have a criminal record and have to live with it. Which means we start by changing the narrative about who and what a quote criminal is and who and what criminality is. Your work as a journalist is key to that. This talk show you wanna do about mental health, incorporating and including the fact that there's actually not, there's actually not much about you and your life, not you particularly, but the people who you're, who you're targeting. There's actually nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. That half of you will be arrested whether or not you do anything. So that's one thing. Remove the stigma of criminality. The second thing, it's not over for your son or for the multiple people in your family. I look at formerly incarcerated activists and I take great hope. It's not over for my brother. He acts like it's over. He certainly acts like it's over. You know, I beat my head against the wall sometimes. I talk to him like, yo, man, what are you doing? What are you, what, what are you doing? You know? But it's not over for him. I look, I look at formerly incarcerated activists and the movement that they're building. If, if it's Susan Burton or if it's Ron, uh, in, 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 in uh, A New Way of Life in, 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 in LA or if it's Dorsey Nunn, I'm thinking about activists in California specifically for, with all of us or none. Um, or if we go to New York and we think about Just Leadership USA or the Fortune Society or any of these prison think tanks that have sprouted up around the country. I mean, the, the Bay is a, is a, is a, is a, is a hotbed of, of formerly incarcerated activists doing incredible work to change things. If I think about this group that's doing incredible work on exoneration, um, uh, Obi Anthony, for example, um, uh, that, that I learned about today, um, I, take, I take great hope in these, in these movement actors that are leading the way um, and, and, and in listening to them. And so, and so, how do, so, so what happens? And so, and, so, and so people are successful when people invest in them. People are successful when people extend love to them. People are successful when people support them, just like everybody else. It's interesting. You know, when we think about, for, I, I'm going I'm to stop rambling and take another question, but when we think about things like jobs, if we think about the way we got jobs, so the world of the academy is strange and weird. So I won't talk about academic jobs, but I'll talk about like regular everyday jobs. Most of us get jobs. Most of us get jobs through our networks. We hear about a position that's open at my cousin's friend's facility. It's not the primary tie, the strong tie, economists have told us since 1979. It's the weak tie. It's the person who knows a person who's, who knows about an opening in a company, and then the person who knows you vouches for you. They put their name on you, in the words of, of, of one of my respondents. They vouch for you. They stick out their neck for you. They say, I've got somebody who's good. I trust them. They're good people. You trust me. Will you hire them? Well, guess what? Really successful reentry programs do the same thing. They send out people called job developers into uh, 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 the, the labor market. And they say, we've got 10 guys that we've trained. They're really good. Why don't you give them a chance? When they're given a chance, they get work. When they get work, they stay out of prison. They do the same thing in housing. They do the same, right? But we, so we get opportunities through networks, but when it comes to people we fear and loathe, we expect them to do it on their own. This is why it's so important to listen to them. You say, what do you need? Just Leadership USA, their slogan, those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but furthest from the resources. That's what they say. You ask somebody who's, who's struggling with what they need, they say, I need a chance. We don't really believe them. We think they need therapy. We, th we, think, we, think, we think they need, right? We, we think they need a self-help group. We think they need AA. We think they, right? They say, I need a chance, you know? And so it's anyway, okay, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I can talk to you for four hours. I'm going to shut up and move on. I'll go to the reception. We'll have more conversation. Please. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so my question is, a lot of the, the, what you had up there was dealing with the system and a systematic issue that we have. And first of all, my father, I'm a daughter of a, my father was incarcerated for 20 years. And um, he raised me actually from prison, educated me from prison. A lot of um, the person of who I am today came from my father in prison. So that breaks a stereotype Absolutely. of black men being in prison and not having relationships with their children. Absolutely. I'm an only child. And so he was very effective in that way. 
um, when we talk about generational curses, I think also that is a, men, uh, a mental issue because in the black community, it's so bombarded about the issues that we have, but it's not necessarily only generational curses. We can put that in society as stereotypes because we have the fighting Irish because they have this, you know, we know that they have a bad temper, they kill, they fight and things of that nature. They're in prison as well. You know what I'm saying? So I agree with you, with you saying that it isn't just a black issue. It's a United States of America issue. So knowing that it's a United States of America issue, then we have to begin to ask ourselves, why have we bought into a system yes. that um, incriminate social economical issues, period, period. Yeah. And once we stop buying into that system and stop judging each other based on a system that is destructing our families, then we can begin to get somewhere. But we have to look at the truth and we have to say, okay, this happened in the past, but even the things of slavery was a system. Yeah. Yeah. And so once we begin to step out of the system and say, okay, it's time to re-educate ourselves and look at each other as human beings, not just as a, or not even human beings, as man, woman, as we were created to be and say, okay, I see you. Oh, I see you. Oh, you see me? Yeah, you get instead no, of pointing the finger. You get no argument from me about anything you just said. Like that, I, I, y yes, amen. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, there's a question there. We'll come here. Yeah, right please. Here? Well, let's go right there because because you're right there. Yeah, please. Thank you so much. <clears throat> my name is Ron Gensler. My question is, I heard you talk about uh, different programs or uh, a, a movement is happening from LA to San Francisco uh, where things are happening. My, my question is, what's the focus and how do you begin to, or how are these groups beginning to uh, touch uh, the lives of this generation in terms of directing or coming together with, with, a, with a common cause? And here's how we walk lock and step down this journey. Because what I, what I often see is there, there are movements uh, and there are groups that march and and close down certain things, but I don't see the the direction that they're going in. What's the what's the direction? Yeah. And no, I appreciate that very much. I, I think I think it's I think it's I think it's a great question, and it's one of those questions where it, it's one of those things that's easy to miss if if this isn't your thing and you're not you're not looking here. You know what I mean? So like like if 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 um. So, for example, the passage of the First Step Act. So, so while I think there are many problems with, with the legislation that just passed, formerly incarcerated activists have been on the ground leading the charge for changes in things like the shackling of pregnant women, um, for, for reductions in sentences, for crack and cocaine disparity. There are different kinds of organizations and different kinds of um, organizational structures, be that movement actors who protest things like for loose brutality, which is which is which 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 I think those movement actors think that what they need to do is bring attention to something, right? So it's not it's not necessarily about for some of those actors, it's about not necessarily changing law and policy. It's about letting you know what just happened. And then some of those actors in that group say, let's change law and policy. Let's push for police accountability boards. We saw that happen in Cincinnati. We see that happening in Chicago. We see uh, responses to police violence and brutality successfully happen in Oakland. Right, like, 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 like these things happen among movement actors, but if we're not, if, if it's not your thing, it's the kind of thing that, and I'm not accusing you of anything also. Like, let me, let me be careful. Yeah, yeah. It's, but, no, no, there are many, so my point is there are many game plans because it's a multifaceted set of issues. So, so what I tried to draw attention to was how this showed up in family, in work, right, in, in housing, in law, and in policy. That's five things, right? And so, and, so, and so, so some groups will take on all five, and some groups will take on one. Some groups will, will so, so Susan Burton, A New Way of Life uh, uh, in LA was, was one of the organizers uh, it, that was incredible, like, that, that had a, a huge hand in, in changing, for example, welfare law that allowed uh, uh, women uh, who had criminal records to access welfare benefits when they were denied uh, in, 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 in the welfare reform bill. This, this allowed families to eat, you know what I mean? It, but, it's, but it's not the kind of thing that, that happens so publicly, that happened because she's got a legal team of five or six attorneys and a policy team, and right. And it's it's, it's so 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 they're different. Different organizations have different missions. Um, I think what I'm trying to push us to do is to listen to them, 
you know, is to, is to, is to, is to, is to be open to hear what someone who's directly affected and impacted by it, what they say their vision of change is, to offer from our place of expertise some counsel, but not so much so that, that, that I'm telling them what they should be doing, but then I say, ah, okay, I agree with that. I have a criticism here. That's my job. You know, I, I think for a living, you know, so, so I, I should think about these questions. You bring me a question. I'm going to tell you what I think, you know, right? Uh, so so, so that, that I bring my strengths, but my strengths align or um, I, I marry my strengths with their strengths. And that's what I'm asking us to do. Now, I'm not saying I do that. I'm saying this is what I'm asking us to do as a model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please. stuff in such a binary, we look at things in such a binary way, he's either, a, or she is either a good person or a bad That's person. Absolutely. We don't see the facets, all the facets of a human being, and then we allow ourselves to be obscured to the foundational issues that we need to address, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. I'm hoping, I, um, I think, mm, I think there's an importance in like people who do cultural work. I, I think there's a real importance. I think um, singers, poets, um, writers, artists, creatives do real work in the culture to help us push the way we understand and think about problems. I think also academics have a role. I think journalists have a role. And I think um, uh, just individual actors who aren't trying to be public with what they do also have a role. So for example, if I run an organization, the, the, the way I help bring about change, some of the change that I bring about is, is the fist. Let me drop a new policy in my organization. I run a real estate company, and what we do is we manage apartment, uh, apartments. I'm, I'm making something up. And then I say in my, in my real estate company, you know what, what we're going to do is from now on, because I'm the boss, what we're going to do is we're going to not check criminal backgrounds. We're going to tell all, all our renters that but we're going to do a different kind of screening. We're paying attention to things that, that matter to, to the landlords that we've talked to. We're going to tell our landlords that and we're going to get a group of landlords that agree with us. I can do that through policy. And that goes so far. But a dear friend of mine, Ronald Simpson Bay, who's a, who's a, um, a formerly incarcerated activist uh, who works with Just Leadership USA, um, and, and, and this is an uh, organization in New York City, he did 27 years on a wrongful conviction. And, and, and he's, he's like barnstorming the country to, to change criminal justice reform. He's an amazing guy. He's one of my dearest friends in the world. I'm not just saying that for brownie points. I'm saying that because I'm honored. Um, and I hope he sees this video. Um, so, <laughs> so maybe he'll return my call. Uh, anyway, but so I'm just honored to be his friend. But, but what he said to me about five years ago or three or four years ago um, was, you know, hey, Ruben, man, you know, you're talking all this policy stuff, but, you know, actually what we need to do is change. We absolutely need to change hearts and minds. And when he said that, I'd be like, you know, come on, man, hearts and minds. Come on, man. But this is what he said. He said, if you don't change, you can change all the policy you want, but if you don't change hearts and minds, when you get in a new administration, they'll wipe it away. That's what he said to me. That's what he said to me. And I was like, come on, man, with that hearts and minds stuff. He's absolutely right. So the work of journalists, Reginald Dwayne Betts writing in the New York Times goes a long way. I know that's a small, like some people read, a lot of people read the Times and are saying like, you know, there's a, there's a New York Times reader and you're speaking to the choir and all that. But this work matters in important ways. You know, uh, uh, Van Jones even, and you know, I got criticisms, you know, of, of, of everybody. You know, my job is to think. I, I have thoughts about everything and half of them are bad. You know, they're critical thoughts. <laughs> anyway, you know, Van Jones, however you feel about him as an activist and organized, whatever the situation is, him doing this work where he works with Jared Kushner and Newt Gingrich and all these sort of folks. Newt Gingrich pinning in 1999 the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the need for reentry services, helped push the discussion. Newt Gingrich, 1999. Atlanta General Constitution, like that work matters in really interesting ways. And so now we're having conversations about what services we need when before, a decade ago, 15 years ago, we were having conversations about how long we should incarcerate people. So, 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 so we, see, we see the thing move when people move it, and, and it's our job to move it. That's what I think. Okay. One, question, one more question? Yeah. Oh, no, and come to the reception. We got a reception. We're yes, gonna have we food. Have we can talk some more. Following. I understand this is wine country. One anyway. last question. <laughs> Sorry, please raise your hand if you could. Thank you. Thank you. This will be our last question. I believe we have time for one last question, and we will go upstairs to the floor. Uh, thank you. Um, 
one issue I didn't, I didn't hear you touch on is the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. And it seems that a lot of the incarcerated population is really, uh, you know, lumpen proletariat that doesn't have an ability to consume. They don't have the financial resources to be consumers. And so we have no value to the system as it is. So our value becomes uh, to the system that, you know, for every cell that's filled every night, you get an X amount of money. And, you know, this is a capitalist system. The, the bottom line is the bottom line. Um, so I'd like you to expound on how we combat the prison industrial complex. Is it divestment? Is it what, what kind of um, means do we have? No, I appreciate that very much. And, and so, yeah, I think that's a really powerful and important argument um, about the profit motive. Um, because most of incarceration is driven by state penitentiaries that don't do private contracts, not contracting to prisons. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm circling the barn real quick. So just, just roll with me because I saw the head like, what, you know. <laughs> right? but, um, but because most of the action is on the state side, when people say prison industrial complex, a lot of the, the, the criticisms of that are, well, most incarceration is at the state level. Most states lose money on incarceration. You know, um, we have to think more carefully about the bottom line. But, 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 it's, but that's not the only way that money gets made in the system, obviously, as you know. You know what I mean? As, as you, and you would tell me in, in response to what I just said if I gave you the mic back, right? Uh, but, but so, like, you know, you got Sodexo and Aramark and all these private, co you know, companies that, 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 provide the money and, and the phone services. I mean, I can't tell you how much money I spent, you know, on, on phone cards when I was calling my brother, you know, these sorts of things, um, or my brother was calling me rather. Um, so so we, see, we see profit happening and the Ruth Wilson Gilmore writes a wonderful book called Golden Gulag, which talks about basically um, gives, gives, a, gives a, 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 um, a, a kind of, she's a Marxist geographer and a historian and she gives this beautiful, um, uh, analysis of how and why this happens in the state of California it happens because it's surplus land, surplus labor, um, surplus people, and surplus political capital is what she talks about. And those things get taken up by the prison. The prison is a geographic for her solution to a social problem. And the social problem is poverty and misery and, and right, this idea of the lump and proletariat, which I have no, nothing to do with. And I, and, I, and, I, and I fill my prison beds with that and it hides my poverty and it does this work. Okay, so I think that there's, there's some, some, some important um, uh, uh, some, some, some fundamentally important um, uh, points that are made from that position. The question is, how do you combat it? And so, and so, and so, and so I also, but I'd like to point to another place because it also gives us another way to think about combating it. Um, there's also economic modeling and economic thinking when it comes to people, which is what I tried to say kind of at the end. This whole idea of actuarial models and risk scores, reducing risk, the notion of public safety over human thriving. I think one way to combat this logic, the heart and mind of the prison industrial complex, if now I don't use those terms in my writing because that's not my position fully, um, but the way to combat the heart and mind of it is, is, is to attack the logic of it. And, so, and so, if, if, so, so I think two ways to do it. One thing to do is to divest. I think that makes a lot of sense. If, if we see companies that are investing and in it, you can divest as a, as a university, you can divest at, you know, through your own sort of stock portfolios, you can divest in that way. And that's interesting and important. Um, you can push, you can think about who you're electing and who they're going to put on what boards of what, you, you know, um, uh, organizations, et cetera, et cetera, what kinds of contracts they're thinking about and looking at. You can push that way to talk specifically about particular contracts with specific kinds of things, whether that be privatizing prisons or the, ex the exceptionally private uh, immigrant detention sort of facilities that are almost all private, right? Like that are mostly private. Uh, uh, so you can, you can think about that. But then we can also attack this logic, the logic of, of, of risk. It's a neoliberal logic. It's 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 a 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 um a cost benefit analysis logic that I apply to people. If you have a high risk score, you're good for services, and we'll route you into services if you have a high risk. Low risk scores. If I route you into services, you you watch too far, too hard, and there it is. What about people who went to jail and not prison and don't have a risk score? What about people who are get right? So 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 we can attack the logic of the criminal of the, of the prison industrial complex, and, and 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 in that way we can cut it off at at its knees. So I think it's multiple. It's multiple sites of attack. Multiple. How do you do the 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 the, the work of this kind of uh, the, the work of changing the logic? 
This is the heart and mind change. This is you writing an op-ed. This is you uh, 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 pushing your senator, and not just you individually, but, but right, us, pushing our senators, our, our, we have aldermen in Chicago, our county supervisors or whatever, ward bosses, however you talk about local politicians, uh, to think carefully about the kinds of things that they bring into a community. It, it's us paying attention to, at the local level, at the state and national level as well, and, and, and that's another way to push. So I think it's an attack on all fronts. That's what I think that we need to do. Anyway, we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. people and I think it would be great if people um, get together and just really support businesses and organizations that employ formerly incarcerated and the name of the restaurant is Delancey Street they have excellent food they're on the Embarcadero thank you thank you Dr. Miller for your vital research and for being a part of this wonderful discussion I want to invite everyone to our reception that is happening now in our Farragut Inn Ballroom. Um, it is up on the upper part of campus. You can either, if you're parked here, you can drive up to the campus. And then there's also a flight of stairs um, that is, that can take you up there. And I also want to make an announcement about an upcoming presentation given by Dr. Richard Rothstein. It's going to be on the a book that he's published called Color of Law. Excuse me. And that is occurring on Tuesday, February 5th in, in the same location at 5 p.m. So that's our next, our next presentation. And please uh, feel free to see, look at it on our website. We'll have it promoted there, but we'll also be sending out reminders. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.